This topic is called world system. So we looked at uh, Orientalism and the forces that led us to believe that there is a separate approach to cities and architecture in every location in the world. Uh, and we're also familiar with the idea that cities are becoming, under the influence of globalization, more and more like each other to the point where Dick and Rimmer believe that we are moving quickly towards a single urban paradigm. And we are continuing in our exploration of the possibility that actually maybe it is uh, something in between, that there are differences, but there are also similarities. And what does that mean? How do we flesh that out? The same issue, interestingly enough, came up in Rabineau's uh, analysis of French colonialism in Morocco, that Leo, uh, Lyotet's approach was a specific modernization appropriate to each individual human society, uh, as opposed to Echochard's approach that was more like Corbusier's idea that there was a universal humanism. And globalization is more of a triumph of the universal humanism approach. Um, and so we're looking at this separation between the East and West once again, uh, the Orient uh, being the others, the people who are uh, colonized for the most part. Now, one of the things that we notice when we study architecture is how important maps are. And this map is an extreme example of what happens when you designate uh, these colored shapes on the surface of the planet that designate uh, distinct zones. It is highly distorting of the reality that these are fictitious uh, arrangements uh, that very much uh, are disrupted by the reality of the place. For example, uh, I saw a, uh, a presentation recently by uh, someone who had graduated from MIT and was working in Liberia, and I believe that's Liberia. Um, and it turns out that this piece of country is really boils down to two corridors, one along this river and one along a railway that runs here. And the rest is jungle. The rest is uninhabited. And so a lot of this is the Sahara Desert. Are there people there? Not many. So these colored shapes are highly, uh, highly, uh, what's the word? Confusing. They are misleading. This is the population distribution in uh, our area of interest of Asia, you'll notice that China's vast size is relatively insignificant because of the population densities clustered along the coastline. India, similarly, is a vast uh, subcontinental arrangement where a vast majority of the population are concentrated in very few parts of the, of the country. And Indonesia, this collection of 17,000 islands, we really don't care much about most of those islands. Really, all we really care about is Java. That's where all the people are. Tokyo is, and other pockets along the coastlines in Japan are similarly the locations that matter. And so this is the, the actual accurate representation of what we're talking about. It is not big colored shapes on the map. It is uh, really very small concentrations of population connected by lines. And this brings us to this idea of how do you represent information? How many of you, if we talked about Tufty, Edward Tufty? Edward Tufty, do you know who Edward Tufty is? You've heard about him because I've talked about him. Right? Uh, Edward Tufty is the father of information design. Information design is more specific than graphic design. Information design recognizes that information uh, itself is not necessarily where meaning lies. Meaning comes from the way, inform way information is presented. And so this data of Napoleon's march uh, to Moscow is uh, really 
captured in spreadsheets of dates and uh, the number of soldiers in Napoleon's army. Uh, you could also make another column that captures the temperature of the winter, how cold was it uh, on every day of this campaign. But when you put it together graphically like this, the meaning becomes clear uh, much more quickly. And so the content of the information is not necessarily enough. To get meaning from information, to get meaning from data, the way it's presented matters as much or more than the data itself. And so the meaning here, you've probably figured out by now, is Napoleon's army was quite large as he marched towards Moscow. This battalion split off here to the north. This battalion split off uh, and rejoined the campaign on its return march. But something happened as the army marched towards Moscow the numbers dwindled dramatically. Uh, and then on the march back, it dwindled even further to the point where uh, Napoleon's army was one, one or two percent of the army that, that departed. And a big factor was the dropping temperature, the, the frigid cold temperatures of the winter on the march back uh, really depleted the numbers. Similarly, uh, the history of cities uh, in the 19th century was one of disease, and uh, cholera was one of the diseases that decimated the populations of many cities. It wasn't until the doctor, John Snow, made this map of dead bodies, who died and where did they live when they died, is marked by the black uh, rectangles. And so by identifying the location of the cholera deaths, and he also testing the theory, located the pumps uh, to the public water supply uh, in this part of London, and by putting those two things together, identified this well as being the source of the cholera that killed all these people, thus revolutionizing the way we treat infectious diseases and the way we build cities uh, up to the present time. And so the way we represent nations as these colored shapes on the map is highly uh, distorted and misleading. What's more important are the points of the cities where the population density is concentrated, places like Bombay, uh, Bangkok, Saigon, uh, some of the places we've been talking about, and the lines that connect those places. And so as I presented on this topic two weeks ago at MIT, the title of my talk was Points and Lines. And the point I was trying to make is the way we study architectural history has to move away from colored shapes on maps and colored shapes on plans and move towards uh, an abandonment of colored shapes altogether and to replace them with points and lines. Uh, for example, uh, and beyond points and lines, there's also the new technologies of computers that allow us to represent changes in the points and lines over time. And so here we have a map of the Roman Empire at its peak in 117 AD, just after the campaigns of Emperor Trajan. Uh, and this is off of Wikipedia, and this gives a certain sense of a kind of a uniform spread of the Roman Empire with uh, your color your, with your crayon and you color in the entire shape of the Mediterranean world. Um, for this view of Islam around the, the early centuries of the Common Era, uh, these are the empires uh, loyal to Islam uh, as it spread during those first centuries. Um, but a, a more precise, and here it is uh, today, the lands of Islam uh, covering the earth. But a more precise uh, rendition of this is given uh, by dynamic mappings. And I'm going to start this over. Um, the beginning point, uh, this is a representation of distinct population centers uh, in the, before the Common Era. And you notice that they start out as points on the map. These are the urban centers. And they grow and expand. And so you have uh, increasing uh, 
spread of, of unification of different tribes and you have the pre-Roman world and then you get around Rome uh, a spread in red of the Roman Empire and this data is takes the form of individual pixels which are far too blunt of an instrument for to get a actual sense of the reality uh, but it, it's much better than the static map that we saw from Wikipedia we get a sense of the Roman Empire spreading uh, taking over the lands that had been uh, ruled by uh, the caliphates, the Islamic caliphates uh, as we move um, into the later periods uh, and then uh, recede after a certain point uh, at the apogee of its development as uh, it fails to compete successfully against the other tribal arrangements that, um, that are in competition with these far-flung outposts of the Roman Empire. But what is the key thing about the Roman Empire? How did the Roman Empire spread so successfully? Do you remember? It were, what was it? But how did they dominate? Well, they'd either, you'd either join them or you'd be wiped off. Religion later, but they were... They conquered and settled. They conquered and settled, and what was their mechanism of conquering and settling? They had this pattern, the Cardo and Decumanus grid, and they had this technology of road building. So it's points and lines. They would set up these points, these encampments, that became permanent settlements in Paris and in London, throughout the Mediterranean world, they established these Roman gridded towns and they connected them with Roman roads and aqueducts and so these are points and lines and that's how they did it they used architecture uh, but not it what it didn't look like this it looked like this these are points and lines uh, our analysis of uh, architecture and urban form reflects the actual reality, the experiential spatial reality of these phenomena, that roads and architectural moments in space uh, and public spaces are the actual true structure of these things. And as we come, become more sophisticated, we develop tools for actually um, modeling this and drawing it and showing it in ways that are more effective. I'm going to skip this one uh, as a, in the interest of time. But this one is an interesting, uh, sophisticated way to represent points and lines. Uh, air traffic as represented through these information designers uh, coming out of the school of Tufti of information design. They are representing flights between points, so they become, they map onto the globe as points that start to glow as greater activity emerges, uh, connected, interconnected by lines as more and more flights trace the path. Now what if we could map things like this uh, as people move from place to place in the world? Can we do that? Well. If you ask the people at MIT, they say, yes, we can. Because every person has a tracking device right now. Every person in the world, pretty much. There's a, I think there's about a million people who don't carry around a tracking device. But everybody else carries around a tracking device. Um, and they think the reason they're carrying this tracking device is so they can make phone calls. No, it's a tracking device. And we can track people and we can map them and we can represent them dynamically on maps like this. And so we actually have the ability to make these kinds of representations of humanity in space, of bodies in space at a global scale. And these mappings are really architecture at a larger scale. And everything we do at a smaller scale uh, can be applied to the larger scale and uh, vice versa. And so it's these early maps that get it closer to right uh, when they locate cities 
on the map and de-emphasize the outlines of nation states. Uh, na the nation state is a recent invention. There really weren't things called nation states for most of human history. It's a very recent invention and it's already going out of style. We increasingly talk about cities and not nations. And um, back in the this earlier period, we talked about the connections of trade routes. This shows the Silk Route, the Silk Road uh, across Asia that connected, and the inland routes that connected much of the early uh, trading world uh, between the different active city ports uh, and the, the lines of sea routes that actively were part of this. And so these, these lines that track uh, empires are actually very soft lines. They're very uh, loose agglomerations, and there wasn't a degree of total control over this territory that is implied by the colored shapes that we put on maps today. And so these types of maps are actually much more useful because they show points and lines. And this butterscotch color is just to keep track of the modern nation state. And so as we move forward in time, we start to see uh, how the very tentative lines connecting between Asia and Europe uh, start to develop with greater certainty and start to displace some of the Muslim lines that here's uh, the island of Ternat that uh, is the source of spices. Uh, these trade routes develop over time uh, into from Muslim hands to to European hands. And so this is, uh, these maps uh, are showing the early days as the Muslims are displaced by the Europeans. The Muslims and the Chinese trade routes start to give way to the dominant sea powers of the European nations. Uh, and the importance of naval power is to protect the monopoly of these sea routes. Colonialism boils down to the importance of having a monopoly control over certain resources. And one way to ensure monopoly control is colonial uh, power. Here's uh, some of the Chinese trade routes between the different ports um, of East Asia and beyond. But if all you're interested in is monopoly control over trade routes, uh, colonialism is just one of the ways you can do it. Here's, uh, here's the, the path, the, the bright red line is the path traced by silver. And so silver started to be used as a uh, currency for global trade, uh, especially after the Spanish uh, conquistadors found vast quantities of silver in, in South America. And so global trade started to take this shape. Uh, and colonialism was part of it, but uh, it was turned out to be optional. Some nation states were more serious colonizers than others. We've looked at France. Uh, we could look at England. Uh, there's a lot to be talked about in terms of South Asia. England, uh, the British colonized not just uh, United States, um, but also uh, most of uh, South Asia, um, Burma, uh, they, they had hands everywhere, as this depicts. And they were serious colonizers. They felt an obligation to bring civilization to the world. Uh, the French, we've talked about them a bit, were also very serious colonizers as the, uh, as the standard bearers of civilization, the French took very seriously the task of bringing rational human endeavor to the whole world. Uh, so the French and the English were very serious colonizers in terms of a cultural mission, whereas the Dutch, the Spaniards, the Germans, the Italians, the Belgians, they were pretty neutral about civilization and culture. They were clearer that it was about the money. And so uh, the money part uh, rose high on their list. Um, the Dutch were completely satisfied to allow local um, rulers to continue to hold positions of power. And they would just 
build railway lines. Uh, and so here you see the expansion of rail systems on Java. And the interesting thing to note is what was important was to connect the rich agricultural lands to the ports on the north coast. And so um, the main ports of Batavia, which is now called Jakarta, Surabaya, Samarang, these ports became increasingly uh, or primary importance because you wanted to move the commodities, the sugar cane, the rubber, the tin, uh, everything you could, the coffee, the tea, from the agriculturally rich lands, from the mining territories, to the port on a ship and off to Europe. Uh, and so you see this early rail expansion in Sumatra. It's really just to connect uh, to the ports to move commodities as quickly as possible. And here you see in Bangkok, um, this is downtown Bangkok. These are the royal uh, lands in Bangkok. And this is the rail line. So you see that the city starts to develop along the rail line and along these uh, active waterways. Um, and these, this is a canal city like Amsterdam. And so the main developments occur along this elaborate system of canals because floating things on barges is basically free transportation. And so uh, this larger story that we're moving into is that colonialism, sure, but it's really about the money. And, uh, and there's been, uh, and so it's, there's a very powerful story to be told that all of these things, all of the architecture and all of the cities and their development can be explained very powerfully simply by asking the question, where's the money? How do we get the money? What is the best means of getting that money? How can architecture and the design of the city help me get the money? And so this is uh, the cartoon version is it's all about the money. But later in the semester, we'll be asking the question, is it really just about the money? Or is money the means to something else? And so it forces us, is, if we pursue the question of civilization to its end, which we kind of did, and then we move on to talk about money and follow it to where it ends, and what is beyond that? And so there's something, uh, the main word I want to introduce into this conversation uh, with today's lecture is the word, it's really two words, world system. And so civilization is a world system and we want to spread it. The French and the British want to spread civilization to all the colonies. Uh, but it's not just civilization, it's civilization in the service of progress, especially progress back in England and France. And it's clear that with the other colonial powers, that it's civilization in the service of money. And so we see that money is, is what makes the world go round. Money in capitalism is a world system. A lot of what we see in the world today can be explained by understanding money and capitalism as a world system. And its forces push us in the direction of a very specific architecture and a very specific uh, urban formation. And, uh, but it, just to give you a hint, there might be more beyond just money. Money might prove to be just a means to other ends as we move forward in this topic.